Matthew 26, Matthew 26, starting in verse 14. That's where we're going to start this morning. We're going to look at a couple of the different gospel accounts uh, in regards to those that um, betrayed Christ. Obviously, we're going to, um, I'm not getting the whole introduction here, but we're, we're going to contrast what Judas did with what Peter did. Uh, they're very different, especially in the end result, especially in the end result of the person. Uh, but we're going to look at those two. We're going to start with Judas Iscariot and his betrayal uh, of Christ. Last, last week or two weeks ago, when Brother Walker taught, uh, we looked at the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And um, uh, the, just the way it all ties together as I'm studying through, uh, I'm going to start this morning preaching a four-part series from the John 17 John 17 is Jesus' prayer just before the soldiers come to arrest him. And so he prays a little bit before that, some of the chapters before that. But John 17 is him praying. If you remember, he goes up into the garden and he takes his disciples and the the three and he has them stop and he goes farther and he comes back and they're asleep. But we have written in John 17 what Jesus prayed. And so we're going we're gonna to look at that this morning in the message over the next couple weeks. Uh, it has a very, four very unique points in John 17 I want to focus on. But just setting the, the backdrop, what we're looking at today is that arrest. And so they're kind of going to tie together this morning's Sunday school lesson and then the message to follow. Matthew 26, verse 14, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest. And he said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him, or, you know, they they bargained with him, uh, with him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. And so we have first that introduction of Judas making a plan. It wasn't spontaneous, right? It wasn't wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't that the soldiers took him aside. Or, you know, got him away from the group and said, hey, what's it going to take? Uh, he's looking for an opportunity. He's looking to betray. He approaches the, the soldiers that have been looking for him. He decides to set this up. And he's going to set this up because of the intent of his heart. And we know the intent of his heart. We don't have to guess. We don't have to read between, between the lines. We don't have to guess. The Lord tells us what the intent of his heart was. And I think we'll see that. John 13, John 13. So I'm going to flip back and forth between these two uh, a little bit here in the time that we have. I'm going to read this, and then we're going to look at one other passage um, in John. In John, in fact, in fact, let's look at them in the order I want to. John 12, John 12 first. Then we'll look at 13. John 12. John 12. We have this um, this account of Jesus spending some time with Lazarus, Mary, Martha, his friends. Looks by every account, and um, uh, the the, uh, curriculum spends some time detailing it, looking at different commentaries that say it looks like Jesus spent time with Larry. uh, Larry. How about Lazarus and Mary? Uh, They rhyme, but they're not right. Lazarus, Mary, Martha. He spent time with them. They were his friends. They were his friends, and he spent time with them. Obviously, Lazarus, he had raised from the dead before this. And so he had spent some time with them, and we have this account that takes place where he's anointed with oil here at their home. And and then it looks like like right after that, if we keep that timeline going, Brother Walker keeps trying to show that timeline of those events at the last week. looks like the events of the last week transpire right after this. So, So one of the last things that happens outside of that week of crucifixion. Here it is. Uh, John 12, verse 1, Jesus, six days before the Passover, it looks like that Passover, where he's going to be crucified, right? Six days before the Passover, he came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Martha served. Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, and we see here Judas Iscariot. It's one of the few times we see him speak. Simon's son, the one which should betray him. 
And he says in verse 5, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? So he's, he's asking the question from a benevolent perspective. Oh, this money could have been used for such better things. This money could have been used more wisely. We could have used this money to help people. That's the way he asked the question. But that's not the thought and intent of his heart. The word of God tells us that. Jesus knows that. Verse 6, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, he had the bag, and he bare what was put therein. So Jesus said, verse 7, then, Jesus, then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. And so Jesus uh, unearths his, his heart and his intent. What was the reason he was questioning that? Not because he was concerned about poor people, but because he saw that as a monetary figure. It could have been more money in the bag. Looks like, we don't have details of this, but it looks like perhaps he siphoned from the bag or took from the bag. Most commentaries say it looks like the Bible said he was a thief. He was a thief. Who was he stealing from? Well, probably some of the finances that came through his responsibility. And these were the finances of Jesus and his ministry. Jesus put him in charge of that, knowing full well who he was, what he was doing, and what his driving motivation was. And so he questioned Mary here in John chapter 12. Now look at uh, uh, chapter 13 and verse 21. Chapter 13 and verse 21. Now we see all of those things. Judas had gone out. He had bargained with these soldiers. 30 pieces of silver, I'll turn him in. He had questioned money because of the thought intent of his heart. And we see it come together here in verse 21 when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit, and he testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one to another, doubting of whom he spake, or wondering, who is he talking about? Now there was, leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Who, who is that? John, right? That's John. It's always the Apostle John. The Apostle John always refers to himself kind of in a third person the one that Jesus loved, or the beloved. And we often see him very close, literally close to Jesus, leaning against Jesus, always stand close to Christ. So there was, leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's John. It's the writer of this book. Simon Peter, therefore, beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spoke. So Peter, in Peter's way, Peter says, Hey, John. Ask him, you know. Peter's known for kind of putting his foot in his mouth and speaking out. But we, I think we can see the quietness of the upper room. We can see the quietness of the time, the urgency of the situation. I think Jesus, um, uh, we can see that. He was, um, verse 21, troubled in spirit. The disciples knew that. They could pick up on that. All the, all the things that he had talked about and prepared them for seemed to be gathering the storm clouds were gathering. Things were getting, there was tension. There was some stress here. And so Peter knows that John's sitting right there next to Jesus because John's always sitting right next to Jesus. And Peter says, John, ask him. Ask him who it is. Ask him who he's talking about. Peter didn't stick his foot in his mouth this time. He had John, <laughs> he had John do it, so to speak. And John wasn't sticking his foot in his mouth, but John was the one. He then lying on Jesus' breast, said unto him, Lord, who is it? Who? who? I mean, this seems to be a tight group. Who? Who's going to betray you? Jesus said, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, it says this, listen, Satan entered into him. So obviously, I think this is one of many references we have that tells us that Judas Iscariot was not a believer, right? If Satan entered into him, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the presence of God could not have been in him. He was an unbeliever. This was not a, a Christian, and I understand we're, 
we're still before the day of Pentecost and before the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ hasn't died yet by a few hours. But this is not a believer. This was not one that was a, a committed follower of Jesus Christ. This was a lost person. So Satan entered, entered into him as soon as he was given that sop, that food item that had been dipped and given to him. Satan entered in. Jesus said, that thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spoke this unto him. And so yet we know, listen, we understand, we know the whole story. But Jesus is saying one thing, um, uh, um, someone here is going to betray me. And then he takes this and he gives it to Judas and he says, what you're going to do, do it now. And I'm, the disciples are looking, what, what's he going to do? What, what, what is that? What does Jesus know that Judas is going to do that they don't know? Some thought, verse 29, because Judas had the bag, Jesus had said unto him, buy those things we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. They they act, listen, I, I think Judas must have been a very, a very good hypocrite, right? I, the disciples didn't seem to know that he was as evil as he was. They didn't seem to realize that he was as bad as he was. They didn't know. You, you would think, wouldn't you think if you had 12 guys that had been hanging around together for three and a half years, that if Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, they'd all go, oh, it's got to be, you know, it's got to be him, right? But they don't know. Ask, who is it? What? Jesus said, it's going to be Judas, because he dips that sop in, and he tells Judas, now go, go do what you have to do. And even then, they're giving him the benefit of the doubt, right? They think he's going to, number one, go settle up, right? Go pay for these Passover items that they're doing. Or number two, maybe he's going to give some money to the poor, but it looks like they still think he's going to do something of good intentions, but he's not. He's going out to meet those soldiers that he had already concocted a deal with. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Um, John 18, chapter 18. Again, I'm preaching from chapter 17. So right in the midst of this is going to be my message for the next four weeks. John 18, verses 1 through 11. We see the, the culmination of this event. Jesus when Jesus had spoken these words, that's the prayer he gave in chapter 17. We're going to look at that next hour. He went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, Cedron, where there was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, he cometh thither with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom Seek ye, they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. That the same might be fulfilled which he spake. Of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, always the one to step forward, right? Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, smote the high priest's servant's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain officers of the Jews took Jesus, and they bound him, and they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. So we, we know these events. We've seen them many times. Judas comes, finds him in the garden, brings the soldiers. They arrest him. Twice, though, Jesus said in this passage, who is it that you seek? And then he says down there in verse number 8, uh, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. 
So it, it, every indication from this passage, Jesus is using the words that he's using and using the definition of who is it that you've come to arrest? Well, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, that's me. Let them go. Right? Let, let the disciples go. You're not here to arrest them. Peter, of course, tries to bungle that, right? Jesus twice had said that and twice had, even had told the, uh, the soldiers here, let them go, let them be, let the disciples go. He stepped forward. I'm the one you're looking for, me. Let the rest of them go. Peter, of course, decides to jump into the situation and take over. Pulls out his sword, cuts off the ear of the, of the uh, servant of the high priest. We know that Jesus uh, heals the man. Again, we have parallel passages here. But Jesus heals the man. And Jesus tells Peter two things. One, put your sword away. And number two, um, that which I have come to do, I must do. They had just drank the cup together in the upper room. They had literally just done that. And the cup that he was to bear, a picture of the blood that was to be shed, he had made that very clear to his followers. They go down, and as he's arrested, Peter tries to stop it. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I'm here to do what I've been called to do. That's why I'm here. So stop. Remember, it was Peter that tried to, I think we have those verses in the, in the uh, uh, curriculum here, but it was Jesus, I'm sorry, it was Peter who had told him before when he was going to Jerusalem that he might die, Peter said, no, you're not going. And Jesus said, what to Peter? What did he say to Peter when Peter tried to stop him? Get thee behind me, Satan, right? Called him Satan. Trying to stop this event because this is, what he had, this is why he was here. This was the event. This was the culmination of all of that, of, of the entire word of God of God's entire plan of redemption. If you look at it, I, I have a book on my bookshelf I've used, and um, I, I keep copies of it at tap too. The Unfolding Plan of Redemption. I think that's a great picture of it, right? From, from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, God began to unveil or show his unfolding plan of redemption. I, you and I know that God in his foreknowledge knew all along what he was going to do. And knew all along what Adam and Eve were going to do. So God didn't invent the plan that day. God began to unveil the plan that day. And so from Adam and Eve up until this moment as Jesus is arrested and he's going to be crucified, that unfolding plan of redemption has been unpacked for mankind. The picture of the sacrifice, the very first one in the Garden of Eden. When God killed the animal to clothe Adam and Eve, and then all the way through as he began to really unpack the idea of the sacrifice for the Israelites and what that was all about. That unfolding plan of redemption was, had been unpacked throughout all of history for mankind. There's a plan. There's a culmination of all this. God has a plan to redeem sinful mankind. This is how it's going to be. And here we are at the very essence of that. And Peter steps out and he's like, wait, I'm going to stop this. Jesus says, no, 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 you're not. You're not going to stop this. This has been unveiled and unfolding from God, from the throne for thousands of years. Mankind needs this. This is why Jesus is here. So um, let's look at a couple of things. The, the, the curriculum gives me like 30 questions to look at on this. Time-wise, I'm not going to do all them, but... Um, John begins with the transition here, the transition of the, of the followers um, that he's been praying for and then right into the arrest. Where did Jesus and his disciples go after prayer? Well, the Bible tells us they went across the brook Cedron or Kedron. I'm not sure of the C um, uh, uh, pronunciation there. Uh, they went to the garden on the east side of Jerusalem. That's where they went. And it was a place that uh, Judas Iscariot knew was a place they often went, often gathered, often met there. Who was with Jesus? Well, he was with the 11 other disciples, all except Judas, right? Because he had been dismissed earlier. Jesus told him, go, go do what it is you have to do. Uh, what other notable event did it look like here that John skipped? Well, he skipped the description of the prayers Jesus offered while in the Garden of 
Gethsemane and the disciples falling asleep. We see more of that talked about in Matthew 26. So we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later. Uh, how did Jesus know where to find him? Because it's a place he often went. And who accompanied him? It tells us a band of soldiers. And listen, these were, um, uh, according to Scripture, these were officers of the high priest and Pharisees. Right? Were there some Roman soldiers with them? Probably. Probably they tended to escort those type of officials around. They tended to be with them. They tended to go places with them. But it was led by officers of the high priest, soldiers of the high priest. And it was led by Pharisees. This was a religious thing, right? This was a religious group that came. This was not a verdict that came down from the Roman government. We know that. Because next week, when Brother Walker teaches this lesson, he's going to get into the fact that, you know, Pilate's like, I see no fault in this man, right? Pilate does everything he can to release him. The Romans have no, no, no issue with Jesus Christ going around teaching and healing people. The religious leaders do. Because they are, they're claiming blasphemy. This Jesus Christ is claiming to be God. We must eliminate him. That's why they're there to arrest him. The soldiers were carrying, the Bible says, lanterns, torches, weapons. Mark 14 says some of them had swords and some of them had staves or, or clubs with them. They uh, must have thought there would be some resistance. And in their defense, there was. <laughs> Peter had his sword and he, and he unsheathed it and he used it. Uh, the only person hurt in all of this was that servant, of the chief priest whom Jesus healed. How did Jesus react? He went to them, right? There was no hiding. There was no scurrying away. And, and I, of course, this is Jesus Christ. He, he, he was in absolute control of the situation. But there were multiple times in the three and a half years we know that people tried to arrest him or get him. It says Jesus removed himself or left their midst or went away because it wasn't time yet. This time when the soldiers came and narrowed down where he was because of Judas, and they came to get him, Jesus, Jesus went out to meet them. Right? Who are you looking for? That's me, Jesus said. I'm the one you're looking for. And so it was a very different reaction this time uh, than all the ones in the past. All right, let's look at um, Peter here. I'm going to jump ahead. How about Mark? 14. Mark 14. And uh, verse 26. Mark 14, 26. Now we're going to see what uh, Peter denying him. Uh, Judas betrayed him to the opposition. Peter denied him. It's a very different reaction, but uh, again, uh, those that were closest to Jesus Christ seemed to be turning against him that night. Mark 14, 26, when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Jesus saith unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me uh, this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered that's a quote from Zechariah 13, 7. You know, when, when the shepherd is smitten, the sheep will scatter. Uh, that's a, a prophecy written about what's going to happen. Jesus Christ is going to be arrested, and where are all his followers? First of all, where are the multitudes of people who six, six and a half days ago were laying down their robes and olive branches in the, in the road? Hailing him king. How, you know, hallelujah, glory to God in the highest. Look who it is. Here he comes. And now they're all gone. His own followers have scattered. Those people that were closer to him have scattered. One's going to betray him. One's going to deny him. All within a couple hours here. So back to verse 20, uh, 28. But after I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. He said, you'll deny me three times. 
before the rooster crows twice this morning. He spake the more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also, listen, also said they all. They all agreed, right? Those, the, the 11 that have gathered together, we'll never deny you, Christ. We will never do that. Jesus said, Peter, you will. You'll do it three times tonight. Uh, verse 32, they came to a place which was called Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, sit ye here while I pray. We're going to jump ahead here uh, to the, uh, let me see, how about, um, oh, here we go, I'm getting my pages out of order. This is why I don't do this. Uh, 68, 66, here it is. Um, uh, more, uh, verse 53. Verse 53, same chapter, I'm sorry. Verse 53. Uh, and they led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. Peter followed him afar off, even into the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants. He warmed himself at the fire. The chief priest, all the council, sought for witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Listen, and found none. They couldn't find any witnesses. For many bear false witness against him, but their witnesses agreed not together. So even in this mock trial, the witnesses all contradicted each other. They had, they had got some false witnesses. They, listen, there were, you and I know this, there were multitudes of people who had been touched by him, healed by him. Their lives had been fixed. Uh, demon-possessed, those that were, were, had um, uh, physical handicaps and physical ailments, those who were out uh, uh, just spiritually that Jesus restored and gave hope to. There were multitudes that could testify of what he had done. So they tried to gather up a few false witnesses, liars, who would try to bear false witness against him and try to claim he had done things he hadn't done or said things he hadn't, done, hadn't said. It's kind of like the story of, of Daniel, right? just before he went into the lion's den, when those had connived against him to try to trip him up. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. So they had to trick the king into making a crazy law. This is the same idea. They couldn't find anybody. So they got these witnesses together and they fed them false information or probably paid them off, whatever they did to get their, their stories. And then as they assembled and gave their stories, the account here is that their stories didn't jive. They didn't even agree with one another because it was fake. Because it was false. Verse number um, um, uh, 56. We'll pick up right where we were. Many bear false witness. Their witnesses agree not together. There arose certain. And bear false witnesses against him saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And within three days I will build another made without hands. Neither so did their witnesses agree together. So they weren't agreeing, that's not what he said, or that's not what he meant, that's not what he said. They were arguing about that. And I think at some point, you know, is it worthy to put someone to death because they say, I can build that building in three days? <laughs> it was just, it was that ludicrous of information going back and forth. The high priest, verse 60, stood in the midst and they asked Jesus saying, answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now with that, listen, verse 63, Then the high priest rent his clothes and saith, What need we any further witnesses? Like that, To him, that was blasphemy enough. We can deal with this right now. Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. Some sp uh, began to spit on him, to cover his face and to buffet him. Some said to him, prophesy. And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. So that's what's going on. Peter's sitting there by the fire in the courtyard outside of the high priest's house, but within the, within the gates of the palace. But he's warming himself by the fire. It tells us that. He's sitting with the other servants. He's watching these proceedings take place. They're beginning to accuse him of blasphemy, and now they've begun to, verse 65, buffet him, beat him, smack him, hit him with their hands. Now Peter, verse 66, was beneath in the palace, 
there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. When she saw Peter warning himself, warming himself there by the fire, she looked upon him and said, Thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth. Hey, like, hey, wait, you're one of them, right? You were with him. And remember what's happening just, just through the gate, just through the door, just inside, in front of the, the priest, and Annas in particular, right here. Jesus has begun to be hit, tortured, pummeled with their hands. They've, they've said they're going to sentence him to death because of what he did. So he's watching this take place, and he's, he's really the only one there, right? We don't have account of any of the other disciples in this setting. Peter's there. And the one maid walks by and says, hey, you're with him. You're not one of our servants. You're with him. He denied it, verse 68. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crowed one time. A maid saw him again, began to say to them that stood by, he's one of them, this is one of them. And he denied it again. A little after that, they that stood by again said to Peter, surely thou art one of them, thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereunto. Listen, they actually determined, you sound like you're from Galilee. You're not from around here. You're one of those Galileans. Clearly you're with him. You, you have that drawl or that dialect, or that, that language that we understand to be from Galilee. We know you're with them. And his reaction, verse 71, he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. Look how, look how strongly he denied his knowledge of Christ. And then, upon that, the second time, the cock crew. Second time, that rooster crew. Peter called to the mind, his mind, the word that Jesus said, before the cock crowed twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. I got a couple minutes left. The culmination of these two. Um, we have Judas Iscariot, who betrays Christ. Um, uh, Christ is arrested. The soldiers got who they wanted. They gave Judas his money. The Bible tells us upon all of that, remember Satan had entered into him. Jesus had told him, that which you need to do, go do. Judas went out, got the soldiers. They arrested Jesus. Now he's going into the, uh, the, the temple here with the, the high priest. He's being interrogated. He's already been verbally sentenced to death. The Romans will have to validate that, but they will. And what does Judas do? when he realizes all that, is, all that has happened. We know this. Judas will go out and he'll commit suicide, right? He's going to kill himself. Peter, Lord, I'll, well, I'll never deny you. Jesus said, you're going to deny me tonight. You're going to do it three times. You're going to do it three times before that rooster out there crows twice. And when that rooster crowed the second time, Peter realized he had already denied Jesus three times. And he left and wept bitterly. Uh, what we don't see, obviously, is Peter then um, take the route that Judas took. Not even close. Peter will have a, a couple bumpy days here, right? Well, we're going to see Peter um, uh, run when he finds out that the tomb is opened, he'll, he'll, he'll run to witness that. He'll be in the upper room when Jesus shows himself. He'll also be the one that tells the disciples, let's go fishing, right? And Jesus will go out on the lake and find Peter and the others again and bring them back. But within about 40 days of this, roughly, Right? Jesus walks around another 40 days, and we have the day of Pentecost. Peter will preach the message where thousands of people will get saved, and Peter will then write the two epistles. He'll dictate everything to Luke, right? Peter is the one that dictated to uh, the, uh, uh, Dr., Dr. Luke, who wrote that, uh, that gospel. Peter then will preach and be the pastor of that church in Jerusalem. He'll be very influential. We see him throughout the book of Acts. 
One of them realizes what he did, and the realization of that leads him to an, an awful conclusion, and that is he, he commits suicide, takes his life. There's no coming back from that. The Bible said he's the son of perdition. He never repented or got things right. Peter, Peter messed up. Peter denied Christ. He, he swore he wouldn't, and within hours was literally swearing that he didn't know Christ. And yet he repented. He got that fixed. Uh, he, he, he made right on it. He went on to give the rest of his life in service for Jesus Christ and the church. And so that's the contrast we want to look at today. Uh, the, the reaction. Uh, what to do when you fall. What to do when you mess up. And mess up pretty bad, right? Uh, you know, Judas, uh, obviously without Christ and the hope of Christ and the hope of the gospel, Judas saw nothing more to live for. Clearly the money didn't make up for the guilt because he had the money a short time, right? Just very briefly. And he ended up ultimately killing himself. The money was not worth it. And the realization of that hit very quickly. Peter, on the other hand, messed up, denied Christ, but ultimately made right on it, ultimately was restored, repented, fixed it, made things right, and went on to, to live a life pleasing to Christ, a very profitable, I think we would agree, spiritually, a very profitable minister of the gospel and so important in the early church. And so two different responses and reactions when they hit rock bottom. Both of them, I think, did that. Next week, Brother uh, Walker is going to pick up with uh, the crucifixion of Christ. Um, I looked at like two of the nine pages he gave me. So we, we didn't get too far on that. But we covered the essence of what we wanted to cover there. Those two that denied, one betrayed, one denied. And then the response and, and how that played out uh, long term. We're going to pick up next week with the trial. The trial, we just started to get into it there with Anna, with uh, uh, before Annas, the uh, high priest, um, and he'll go back and forth with Herod and with Pilate and then back to the high priest and so forth, and ultimately uh, crucifixion. That'll be next week's lesson, which I think we would agree is the center point uh, of all that we believe, preach, and hold to, the resurrection, uh, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection right here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we've had today. Thank you for the privilege of being gathered together in your house this morning. Lord, we thank you for this Sunday school hour. Lord, we looked at some very important events leading up to the crucifixion. Lord, we wanted to make sure we, we dove in a little deeper on all the things that transpired uh, with Judas Iscariot, with Peter, the betrayal and the denial of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we learn from that. May we look at their, their lives, their responses, their reactions Lord, ultimately the repentance that Peter had, uh, and, and, and had, he was restored and used mightily for the kingdom. Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, guide our, our steps as we uh, prepare our hearts now for the morning service, for an opportunity uh, to learn and grow together as we continue to dig into some of these very passages that we've looked at already. We thank you. We ask all this in your name. Amen.